<laughs> so, so, um, so, just following up on this very interesting uh, uh, talk, they, um, I mean, what did they die of then? If the you shown at least that the quality control systems were, were still working fine, um, what did they die of? Yes. So, so uh, what, 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 what we can, what we can find in Cervizia, in all cases, we uh, uh, that where we, we can make conclusions that the the, for example, if we if we prevent uh, 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 aggregate formation, the cells live longer. But what we observe is that actually this leads to a stress to the cell because actually you have all these small seeds of misfolded proteins that float around in the cytoplasm and that induce a stress response. And the first thing, that I mentioned it for, uh, um, when I was asked, when, when you have this uh, uh, mis prototoxic uh, uh, stress in the cell, you actually down-regulate the diffusion barrier, or you open the diffusion barrier, and now the circles start to leak out. So when you don't form an aggregate, you live longer, not because the aggregate is killing you, but you live longer because the, the misfolded protein are treated like a stress that opens a diffusion barrier and leads to the release of aging factors to the progeny. Every single time where we have been able to prolongate the lifespan of a yeast mother cell, the DNA circles were leaking into the bud. And each time that we very surgically mutated by single amino acids that lead to the detachment of the circles from the pores, to let them leak in the bud, the cell, the cell is long-lived. So, so far it looks like what they always die of is accumulation of DNA circle. Now, how do the DNA circle kill the cell? Probably by the fact that they do change the nuclear pores. It's the, 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 strategy, the, 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 the model we are, we are investigating now. So the, the, the circles, as they ac accumulate exponentially, pores accumulate with them exponentially as well. And so all mother cells are full of pores. But as I said, those pores are not uh, 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 classical pores, they are specialized pores with some subunits gone and others that have joined the pore. And those pores are very good at import but very bad at export. So they are specialized. So we think that this leads to an imbalance that actually kills the cell. Do you see any change in reactive oxygen species? We have not touched radio... Uh, no, not radioactive. We have we have we are not attached to ROS so far, uh, uh, because the ROS data is completely ambiguous. If you prevent a, a, a respiration, you are short-lived. You don't form ROS, and you're short-lived. And and you or in service, you're pretty. You can inhibit certain complexes in the respiration, but still produce ROS. Yes. But, but in the mutants where, where, where uh, 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 um, people were showing that they were preventing ROS formation, these mutants were short-lived. It looks like a certain level of ROS is necessary and too much ROS is for sure deleterious. You take a mammalian cell, primary cell from the mouth, and you culture it. It's an S, right? After a while. Stop dividing, it's an S. Yeah. Aging, aging. Lifespan is short. The reason is because you grow them in atmospheric level of oxygen. If you decrease the atmospheric level to 2%, then they will live forever. That's a no, it's a known observation. Yeah, sure. There are many things if you, if, you, if, if you delete for every fifth gene in the yeast genome, if you delete it, you will live short. So do you live short? Why? Because you are sick? Uh, no. If you if you grow a cell outside of the body in a petri dish with high oxygen uh, high oxygen concentration to which it is not made to 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 live with, and that you find them to live short, what a surprise! Right? No, it's not because it's due to reactive oxygen species. Sure, and, and if you if you if you grow yeast cells in 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 uh, in H two O two, 
they leave short. Right, and also if you take away... Uh, if you grow them at 42 degrees, they leave short. A scavenger away, scavenger of frost away, they leave shorter. Sure, but 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 but, but many of these things living short is an e is an easy phenotype, right? Yes, like that, almost like that. Do we have any questions for the small GTPAs people? I'll ask one. <clears throat> I was curious for. Uh, am I saying your name Maha, Maha? Yeah. Male. 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 Um, can you say a little bit more about Bragson? Um, I was wondering, uh, is it, first of all, is it a natural product or a synthetic uh, chemical? And, and also, um, has there been any uh, structure activity relationship? Can you put, maybe perhaps put a fluorescent probe on it? Yeah, well, it, it's not a natural product. And we did indeed a SAR, uh, SAR study with that. With we, uh, I couldn't show that. Obviously, because it's not published and we have some valorization issue as well. But uh, we worked with analogs on one side and with mutant of the protein on the other side. So we're pretty confident in the binding moon and what is important or not in the molecule. Do you think you could put, a, uh, put say, a fluorescent probe on it somehow and retain its activity? Um, it might, uh, let me see, it might be possible, but you have to try first, right? But uh, we didn't try that yet. We have some other thing going on, like, but after the phenotype take place, look, like click chemistry kind of thing, but uh, so we are working on those kind of ID, as ideas, but uh, we don't have a fluorescent compound, for example, right now. Is it rapidly reversible? I was just wondering, because it's, Kind of an interesting binding mode. Maybe would, can, can well, it, I I didn't do kinetics on that, but uh, yeah, you just you treat your cells for half an hour. You just wash for half an hour, like meaning you just change the medium, and half an hour later you fix the cell, do the microscope and the microscopy, and it's almost completely fine. So you can see that it's not as compact at the beginning, but it's pretty good. Okay. You haven't tried to look in real time though. Like no. No, 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 I didn't. That, that would be interesting. There's lots of things to do, I think, in terms of visualization, real-time, real turf microscopy, this kind of approach. Yeah, definitely. We have a question So here. I have a question for now and Bruno. So well, you show the ER to gouge and the plasma membrane trafficking, which is a classic of pathway. But there are also some reports, ER to plasma membrane direct transfer and the bypass the gouge. So I wonder uh, how common this is and uh, why you think uh, certain cargo want to do this. So what's the advantage you want to bypass the gauge? So do, uh, do you know about this? I mean, I, I, is this under certain conditions, under, in certain mutants, certain cargos? Yeah, very specialized conditions. So I, I am not sure that, I mean, so what I know is this ER, for instance, uh, plasma membrane contact site. I think they, they are used mainly to transport or to exchange lipids, right? I think it's not, it's not really used for protein transport. Yeah, I think that there are a few reports that yeah, some protein that can be also transported, but yeah. I'm not sure how strong the evidence is. I don't know. I think it's, it's, the evidence is very strong for lipids because, I mean, this protein can, I mean, the protein that forms this uh, contact sites, I mean, are transfer, uh, lipid transfer protein, but uh, so I, I don't know. You know, Cathy, or? That's exactly right. Like you said, it's right. And so far, there is not RabGTPS involved in this. <laughs> I think so. All <laughs> smear. Not yet. So you were referring specifically to um, bypass well, mechanisms well, I mean, in the, terms of contact sites. Uh, I, I don't think it's a late phase. I, Randy Sheckman has a review article a couple of years ago. So they call it unconventional secretion. Um, which is basically protein secreted, uh, oh. but without going through the Golgi. Oh, so those are separate mechanisms. Right, those I think it's very specialized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a separate process, and, and proteins are transferred. Yeah, so unconventional secretion mechanisms. And I guess other RABs involved. <coughs>
I mean, I think this process is very well known in neurons, right? I mean, you have uh, there is two paper in eLife recently, uh, yeah, where you have a, a, a you have a lot of uh, anglicosylated protein that bypass the Golgi that are transferred to uh, to the plasma membrane. Um, I think at least in the in the dendrite on axon, this is due. I think the paper saying that is due to, uh, I mean, direct. I mean, transport from the ER to the recycling endosomes and then to the, uh, I think it's a recent paper in cell or in neurons about this. Oh, no, I, no, worry, but I can just make a, as a remark that YPT11 uh, in Cerevisia seems to be associated with uh, ER uh, uh, plasma membrane contact sites. Uh, uh, at the butt cortex, but there is very little known about. Is this a rab GTPS? It's a rab GTPS, yes. So it's as far from, I mean, sometimes we. No, no, no. With some YPTs, um, it's not even clear if they belong to the YPTs or to the next rab, uh, next GTPAs family. So YPT11 is, I think, one of them. But maybe, you know, now that if you say it, maybe they are involved in some membrane processes, it will be interesting. Tommy? I think I got confused in your talk. <laughs> yes, your talk. Me? Okay. Oh, you? So yeah, no. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Tell me. So the constipation that these yeast cells are getting when they have the DNA attached to the nuclear pore that is leading... It's not really constipation, but yeah. So the ent ent entry, so entry goes, but the exit is difficult. Yeah. So, so the way I understood it is that if you have this piece of DNA, this plasmid, hooked to the nuclear pore, um, that exacerbates the effects. The cells get sick because they are not getting a proper balance of egress and ingress into the into the nucleus. Is that correct? Yes. So that's the constipation effect. If you want. If you want. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So if I did not have that piece of DNA, um, then what you were saying is that you were connecting the fact that you were getting this trapping of the neural process, depending on the biophysics, let's say, the ceramide, etc. Is that, is that the way you were thinking it? Mm -hmm. So, um, but under normal conditions, uh, uh, things do move correctly, right? So these are consequences of your experimental setup of pushing the system so they couldn't partition correctly the, the nuclear pores. Right? No. no, 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 no. In a normal wild type uh, cells, without uh, pushing anything, the, the, you will see the pores accumulate in the old in the aging mother cell, and while she gives birth to. Uh, uh, daughter cells that have a normal, normal number of pores. Count the, so how do you count the nuclear pores? So uh, uh, the way we have been counting nuclear pores so far is mainly by fluorescence intensity. But it, that's, okay, but the nuclear pore, sorry, the nuclear membrane that is forming in the budding cell, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just simply sampling by concentration surface, I mean, density of nuclear pores. In other words, you will get lower number of nucle mother nuclear pores simply because you have less nuclear membrane, right? No, so, 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 so we did, yeah, yeah, okay, Let, I, I, can, I can give you more detail. I can give you more detail. If you let, let um, wild-type yeast cells age in which you have labeled specific nucleoporins, some nucleoporins will accumulate to, and, and we can show they are associated with a pore, and, the, and these pores associate to very high levels such that at, at the end of her lifespan, a yeast mother cell can have more than 10 times more pores than a young cell in a wild type. So we go from 100 pores to 1,000 pores, mm -hmm. or, or, or even more. We, we have seen cells that are even more. And the asymmetry is maintained. The daughters are born with normal, normal number, number of pores. If we prevent DNA circle accumulation, there are mutants that prevent DNA circle accumulation, then you don't accumulate pores. If you detach the, pore, the circles from the pores, then you don't accumulate pores. If you promote circle formation, 
then you accumulate pores. And each time, the lifespan of the cell correlates extremely well with the, with the pore content. Mm -hmm. The cells that have a lot of pores die early. Mm -hmm. The cells that, have low, that accumulate pores much slower live much longer. Mm -hmm. What we know is that we, the circles, when it is at the pore, it recruits it acetyltransferase, SAGA, and SAGA acetylates. And this is something that happens in a normal cell cycle, in interphase. And SAGA acetylates a number of nucleoporins, such now we can mimic acetylation. If we mimic acetylation on these nucleoporins, we accumulate pores without circles, and the cells die earlier, mm -hmm. as a short lifespan. Mm -hmm. Those nucleoporins that we are playing with are involved in, 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 in controlling the, the import versus export. In all cases, what we see is an increase import and a decrease export. Mm -hmm. That's the data. Mm -hmm. Does that clarify? I'm just question. kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. So I'm wondering, um, <laughs> forgive my ignorance on this, but um, for Rab proteins and ARF proteins, uh, what are the, in the most primitive eukaryotes, are, are they present? And you know what insights, if you look at the very, very simple eukaryotes, do, can you get about what's the most uh, fundamental mechanism of Rab proteins? It seems like now there's maybe a diversity of function, but was there, when this family formed, was there, is there some insight from looking at the evolution? Um, do you know? Maybe not to repeat the question for posterity there. The question that we cannot answer. If, <laughs> if we know uh, about evolution of the Rab family, so from what I remember, um, th there will be... Hmm? I'm trying to be an ARF, so I'm not just... Oh, ARFs. <coughs> ARF, basically they can be one. Rabs, um, there is sort of like the minimal uh, set uh, with and without duplication, so it could be less than service. Yeah. Does Giardia have Rabs and Arf? Yeah, I, who says? Okay, Kevin. Just one thing, so the, the first eukaryotic common ancestor had um, ARFs and RABs. It had um, very few ARFs, maybe just one, I'm not sure exactly how many, but very few and more RABs. So it seems to be a, a, um, a conserved feature to have few ARFs and, and more RABs. Um, so, and this goes way back to the, yeah, the first um, eukaryote, <laughs> the last common an as an ancestor of eukaryotes. Are they in archaea or in... Any uh, yeah. Well, so there's been a, a discovery. Yeah, there's a discovery of a very recent, uh, very recently, of an archaeobacterium that's the closest to a eukaryotic ancestor that, that has been identified. And so there are um, ARF-related and RAB-related proteins in that archaeum, that archaeobacterium. So that's a that's actually a very interesting um, path to follow. Yeah, yeah, that's that would be very interesting to follow up. They are they are different than the eukaryotic ARFs and RABs that we have, but clearly there's signatures that make them that put them into that family. So, yeah. So it goes. Uh, so yeah, we don't know what, we don't know anything about this organism because it's only been identified at the genome level. So what will be very interesting is to see what its membrane um, compartments are like, and that will await its identification. We only know about its genome through deep sequencing through its identification. So. So Bruno, sorry. Uh, no, ju just to finish on this question, so I mean, so this is highly, uh, I'm talking about uh, RAB GTPA, so this is highly conserved throughout uh, evolution. And I think so now we have genomic data on many, many uh, species. And I think there is, uh, I mean, you need five or six, I mean, you, you, there is a minimal set of five or six uh, RAB or YPT that are enough to sustain the uh, secretary and probably endocytic pathway. So this is uh, RAB1 or YPT1, I think YPT3, uh, YPT6, YPT5, and maybe another one, and SEC4, and 7. 
Uh, I'm not sure about seven. You need? Yeah, maybe, yeah. YPT seven. So can I just say one more thing about why, why not in bacteria, probably? Because they don't have intercellular compartments. They don't need uh, this machinery. But there will be some in bacteria that are um, parasites um, in of human cells. They, they, can, uh, they actually have sometimes rub or rub interacting proteins that they took. And you can see it transferred horizontally from, their ho from hosts many, many years ago. Uh, so not snares as such, no. Um, there, there are longan domain proteins, so the longan domain is present, and that is present in some snares, as such as. Uh, that does suggest exactly that, yes. Well, there's there's many questions, yes. <laughs> stop this misconception of people saying grubbers are involved only in fusion by saying they are involved in any all aspects of cigar trafficking not just fusion formation too and in the east uh, is there examples where one transport step could have more than one ypt involved yes so um what once one that I showed is, for example, the going from trans Golgi vesicles to the plasma membrane actually uses two rubs, YPT th three one and three two or three two, and sec four. So they s they share the step. Okay, but, but, actually, but they share. The idea is that uh, one goes halfway and then the other one takes yes. off. Oh, you mean if they are parallel? Is that really uh, true or is that just true for certain types of granules and then YPT31 um, could, could take all the way to the, could bypass SEC for, for certain cargo or something? No, overexpression of YPT31 does not suppress SEC4. Okay, uh, still, still, whatever sec for transports could be, could be very important, yeah, yes. and, and lead to lethality. But that doesn't necessarily mean that YBD31 could still take some all the way, no? Just well, it doesn't interact with, also, with the specific effectors of sec four, so I, I don't think so. Yes. So, at least in the endocytic clutching curve vesicles, we see after the vesicle buds from the membrane, we get two waves of two different rubs coming in. One is rub 5, and the other one is rub 35. And they have different, so they're recognizing different lipids, they have different effectors, and they come, even though they're coming in the same vesicle, when you trap them, right, they come on, on waves that are, you know, they're not synchronized, they're slightly shifted in time, right? So, um, uh, and I think the RAP5 is, I think, very important for homotypic fusion. RAP35, I'm not exactly sure, maybe it's more direct. It's more recycling. Recycling. The recycling. Yeah? That, that's recycling. No, no, but this is endocytic code vesicle. So, yeah. you have, it's, it's not recycling yet. The first paper on RAP35 was on uh, was in my lab by Arno Eschlein. No, no, but what I'm, what, what, I don't mean to... Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, what, was what I'm trying to say is if you actually track on the vesicle the, the rub, right, they're coming, but that vesicle will actually go to a rub 5 still, right? So it's... Uh, but so it's, you, are they mutually exclusive? No, they're not. No. Yeah, that's the point. No, but, but they're looking at different... 
they're not looking at the same effectors. Well, of course, no, but uh, I think that... No, no, I mean, the, 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 the very first paper on RAP35, so in current biology in 206, I mean, so we measure the internalization of transferrin, okay? And uh, I mean, the, uh, the message was that RAP35 was involved in a very fast, in very fast recycling of uh, um, transferrin even between and before up 4 So we don't know if these vesicles that form, I mean, reach the endosomes and then recycle, is what I wanted to say. Well, so I would like to counter that, right? So those experiments are based on, let's say, dominant mutants, right? Right? And, uh, no, and sRNA. At that time, we used sRNA, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So either you do that or you do a, a depletion by RNA, right? Something, right? So these are slow effects. It takes a while until you build it. And I'm trying to make the point that if you just watch the arrival now of the proteins without perturbation in the system, right? Um, as I said, in the endocytic corridor, the two proteins are coming, right? Into all the coded vesicles, right? And it's regardless whether they have transferrin or not. So there's no discrimination between transferrin and EGF receptor or whatever. That they, they don't care, right? The sorting happens later, right? So I think what I'm trying to also bring into discussion is that we have the experiment that we do where we do the slower perturbations and we get the read on the concept of that as compared to now the ability to. To, to, to see what's going on without the perturbation, and there are some differences, right? Yeah. But this is not incompatible with the fact that RAP35 could be involved in fast recycling, right? I mean, RAP35 associated with the vesicle, and then... No, I, I just said that the... Uh, I have no issues with that. Yeah. That's fine. I'm, I was just saying that, that the, the vesicle that pinches from the membrane and came in, it yet has to decide what to do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it going to recycle, or is it going to the end of... This, vesic this very, very first vesicle is going to hit in one first compartment, and then there's going to be a sorting, right? And, and now I'm going to recycle, I'm going to go a bit deeper, right? But that very first vesicle doesn't know yet what to do. And in spite of that, is collecting the two wraps, right? So, right? Uh, we were discussing a little bit about Just to follow up on this, uh, if you don't mind. Um, as we were discussing uh, at lunch, I think the likelihood is uh, in mammalian cells, given the complexity of the of the trafficking, is that you always have uh, you're always going to have more than one rab uh, simultaneously in the same vesicles or, or most of those, because uh, what they're creating is domains, and uh, and those domains create different functionalities, and you're probably going to need different functionalities sometimes simultaneously uh, or with different kinetics uh, that they're forming and 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 uh, and, um, and um, removing and uh, disappearing and and etc so it's all this combinatorial scheme uh, that uh, where the ramps would be uh, i think that's the most likely scenario and that's entirely consistent with you seeing more than one rap coming in even at the in a, in a yeah, i just want to confirm this is not. This is not overexpression, yes. This is genetic. Okay. And dodging is like right? So um, I, I, I just want to, to add to the conversation. Um, what could be the role of, of cargo? Uh, because we saw of uh, the talk of Bruno, uh, you had RAP6, and that could move to the plasma membrane, to the focal adhesions, to a melanosomes. Um, we saw in the talk of, of, of NAVA that you had uh, YPT1 that could go to the Golgi or to the to the pass. So. Is there any connection between the cargo that is in uh, the vesicle that could determine uh, the recruitment of, of reps and that determines then the recruitment of effector proteins? So, thank you for asking this question. This is exactly what we are, the way that we are thinking. When I talked about the module, I think that the cargo is the one that will determine which Jeff will come 
which rub will come, but also will affect which effector. Because otherwise, it, that's my, our model and we are working on it. And we have some evidence that it's true. So how do you, how do you make a carrier in the signature pathway, let's say, that only has cargo X and not cargo Y? Well, just to answer your question, together with uh, Judith, we are not doing it in the secretory pathway because it's easier to do it in autophagy, and we have two different types of autophagy depending on the cargo, and, and these are all not stress, not under stress, selective, uh, which which now require go to different organelles, and yes, what? But I think the problem on normal secretory pathway, let's say. Right? And you're dealing with smaller carriers. I I don't understand how you, 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 you will end up having a carrier that has only one type of cargo so it can go here or there. No, she's okay. So that's for Bruno. Um, no, I think you have I mean as you know you have few examples of uh, a direct interaction between Rab Rab and the cargo. I mean for instance, between RAB11 and beta adrenergic receptor, and this drive probably the recycling on, uh, of um, beta adrenergic receptor to the plasma membrane. So this is known for this. Uh, I think there is also the example of RAB21, is a uh, work by Joanna Ivaska, and uh, I think it's involved RAP21 for recycling of a pool of integrins. So, uh, and so in the uh, it's not the bulk yeah. that you're doing the sorting. No, we we we, we talk about uh, yeah specialized, um, and also actually, also there was a report I think from Keith Most of a long time ago that RAP3 was directly interacting with the poly uh, poly poly AG, uh, yeah for for transcytosis for this. Yeah, because I think. When I was working on the hops, I, I thought, okay, it's on the vesicle and it's there. But I realized that it's much a, a too static picture. It's it's probably a, a continuum of, of, of uh, recruiting reps or, or hops or tethers, and and then in the end, uh, it will, like like Miguel is saying, it, it will form domains uh, or um, depending on the cargo. Uh, one of, of these factors that is recruiting may kind of win, uh, and and then you you get that this vesicle recruits these effector proteins, and it, it makes a kind of decision then okay so I should go left or or, or right, uh, but it, I I can imagine that cargo could be very determining uh, in that. Uh, and also, cannot. sorting is, is not 100%. So, so you may take some cargo to the, the wrong side, but the, the general, uh, I think the majority of cargo may then influence what is happening. Okay. It's just you know, a fault yeah. of proving. Okay. Oh, yes. I have a question for uh, Yves Barra. Hey. <laughs> He's okay. Uh, uh, have you found some uh, other protein, uh, a part of uh, RE3, which aggregates and is linked to uh, memory on aging? Yes. So, so uh, uh, proteins with this type of domains, PolyQ, particularly, uh, uh, there is a, a full study that has been had been done from the lab of Sul Linquist. <clears throat> and the yeast genome contains at least 150 by the threshold they used, and actually, if you uh, uh, losing a little, not much, but a bit the threshold, it goes rapidly to 200, 250 proteins. And actually, if we needed to loosen a little bit their criteria to get to We3, We3 was not in their 150 top. So, so there are way more. And uh, uh, we know of at least uh, uh, five more proteins that are actually aggregating in response to pheromone and that are uh, involved in, in the uh, 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 the phenotype that you saw. So it's not just we 3 we 3 is a key one, but it's not alone. And we are now characterizing a few more that re that respond uh, uh, to uh, uh, heat shock, for example, and that uh, are necessary for, for stress memory. 
described long time ago by Pasteur, actually. Uh, it's called uh, 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 acquired uh, thermotorrents. And, uh, uh, um, and we have some hints about also some uh, 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 proteins with this type of domains involved in, uh, in uh, toxin uh, uh, response. Okay, on, on the, are there some uh, also, uh, protein aggregation linked to memory and aging in other organisms? Or? So a, a protein aggregation has been a classical hallmark, hallmark of, uh, of uh, aging cells, but generally nobody knows what are in those aggregates. Um, we know in terms of memory that uh, uh, the, the Candle and Lindquist lab had worked on at least one other protein that aggregates in response to stimulation in the synapse, uh, 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 aggregate in response to stimulation of the synapse and is required for long-term potentiation of the synapse. So directly involved in the memory. And there is uh, the same protein in Drosophila is involved in, uh, in the memory of courtship. Uh, um, our males, flies, have to learn courtship. They do this by a protein that aggregates with a similar aggregation domain. And that protein happens to be the closest homologue to V3. We have a question here. Uh, so, uh, Question from a computer person to you. So you said the cell has to distinguish, uh, you know, DNA cell from non-cell. So basically, compare it to very long strings, and there are lots of computer algorithms for this. So are there any kind of them being used? For example, one which can be used is uh, to compare two signatures, cryptographic signatures of the two strings. You know, so to so, so, so we think so far from all what we have been able to do, it's completely sequence independent. So we don't think that they are recognizing any of the, of the sequence. So what we think they recognize is, is, uh, is in Cerevisiae, it's whether they have a centromer or not. So we simply need to add these 150 nucleotides to any piece of DNA, and now it will, it will condense during mitosis. And, uh, and if we, if we in, in Pombe, it's simply the history, the fact that you saw that it was on, in the chromosome was sufficient. 